Well, good morning, Walden Church. For the past couple weeks, we've been looking at this idea that we are all a mess, right? We're all a mess. Nobody's perfect. And we've also said that messy people need this. They, they need, we need church, right? We need church. We need to be with other messy people so that we can all help each other. And Jesus helps us. In fact, it's in his nature. We said that he goes to where the messes are. He goes to those messy lives, those messy people. He reaches out his hand and he lifts them up. He helps them. And John 3.16 says so famously that God so loved the mess, right? God so loved the mess that he sent help. And if you've missed the past couple weeks, you know, we're just saying that Somewhere along the line, sometimes we make bad choices. There's no shame in admitting that you're not perfect. None of us are perfect. We make a mess of life. Could be anywhere. Could be with your health and welfare. Could be your fitness. Could be academically. Could be your grades. Could be your career. You could have made a mess of a relationship or, you know, with your spouse or could be a, a messy relationship with your parents or it could be downward and it be a messy relationship with your children. We've all done it. We've all done it. Somewhere, somehow, we have made a mess of things. And the title on our sermon notes or uh, on this YouTube video has been Out With The Old. Okay, we've been doing that for a couple of weeks. We've said Out With The Old. What do we mean by that? Why are we calling this out with the old? Well, I wanna tell you, because we've already established that we're a mess, right? We've established that we're a mess, but God loves us anyway. I mean, we were taught that as kids in, 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 in the songs that we learned to sing. Jesus loves the little messes, all the messes of the world, yes? So I want, to be, I want to push back on a theology that we end up learning that may be uh, happened by accident. I don't think this happens on purpose. And that is, if I'm a mess and Jesus loves me, then doesn't that mean that Jesus loves my mess? Do you see how we might think that? You know, we tell people outside the church that they don't need to clean themselves up before they come to Christ, that he loves them just as they are, and, and in that moment. But are we also saying then that they never need to change? I mean, if Jesus hung out with sinners and he drank wine, well, that's what I do, so I must be like Jesus. That's what country music would tell you. Miranda Lambert wrote a song called Heart Like Mine. And in the song, she says, I ain't the kind of woman that you take home to mama. I ain't the kind to wear no ring. Sometimes I always get stronger when I'm on my second drink. Even though I hate to admit it, sometimes I smoke cigarettes. The Christian folks say I should quit it. I just smile and say, God bless. Because I heard Jesus, he drank wine. And I bet we'd get along just fine. He could calm a storm and heal the blind. And I'd bet he'd understand a heart like mine. No. <laughs> no. Miranda Lambert may be good at writing country music, but she's no good at understanding Jesus. Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, he came to help. That's good. That's the good news. Our Heavenly Father saw our mess and he sent help. And it was the mess that drew him close. But this isn't about messing up and asking for forgiveness and then messing up and asking for forgiveness and then messing up and then asking for forgiveness over and over and over and over and over again. That is not what it means to be a Christian. This, what we do here at church, is not about personal behavior modification. Shouldn't we be getting better Shouldn't we be growing as a Christian? Shouldn't you and I be maturing? 
Yes, he loves us. But he doesn't want us to stay that way. Look at the example that we read last week. Last week, we talked about the woman that was caught in adultery. And after every single one of her accusers left, Jesus did not say to her, hey, let's hang out. He didn't say that. He said, go and sin no more. In other words, change. Yes, God loves you just as you are, but he has plans for you. He has plans that require you to become new. You see, when Jesus called his disciples, he entered into a relationship with them by first saying, follow me. Jesus wants us to go along with him. Jesus wants us to see the world like he sees the world and to see other people the way he sees other people. Revelation 21.5, Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. And you, listen, you are one of those things. He loves us, yes, but he's working on you to make you new. So it's out with the old. What is the old? Well, it's our mess. It's our old life. It's our old way. We're saying out with the mess. Your, your life is not a country song. Let, let's not be comfortable with our mess. Let's not live in our mess. Being a Christian is not like doing the laundry, okay? Washing clothes, it is the most repetitive thing that we do. Step one, get clothes dirty. Step two, clean clothes. There's always laundry to do. But the Apostle Paul sets us straight. He says in Colossians 9, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Do you know what put to death means? It means stop doing sin laundry. Christianity is not about sinning over and over and over and over again, and then asking for forgiveness over and over and over again. So what is it all about? Look at verse 9 and 10. Paul says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Paul says your old self is a liar and it is earthly. And he says, put on your new self, which is made in the image of God. Out with the old, in with the new. I know, I know. We picked a super hard subject to wrestle with this summer because really all of this is about sin and sin is such a misunderstood subject because on the one hand, we're all trying to stop sinning, right? But on the other hand, it's impossible. Paul says, put on the new self. Jesus says, follow me. And my Sunday school teacher said, don't get hung up on sin. When you ask for forgiveness, God instantly forgets it. So don't worry. Really? How does that work? Well, you know, God's really old and your memory is the first thing to go. So God has Alzheimer's? Do you see what I mean? On the one hand, we know that God knows all things. But we also say that God does not remember my sin. The author of Hebrews says, no creature is hidden from his sight, but we are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. How could the God who knows everything, who sees me exposed, at the same time also be unaware of my sin? Well, one of the verses that we get that from is Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. It's a great verse, love that verse. We quote it often, but the more popular one is Hebrews 8.12. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I will remember their sin no more. Does that mean that God forgets your sin? I don't believe God forgets anything. He is omniscient, he knows all. 
But what this passage is talking about is his forgiveness. When we sin, God does not hold it over us. When the Lord forgives, he does not call our sins to mind to punish us or to chew us out. He does not take us by the hand and whisper in our ear, shame on you. He says, I will remember their sins no more. It doesn't mean it slips his mind. It just means that he doesn't hold it against us, meaning he treats us. He treats us as if we had never sinned. This passage is about his compassion and his grace and his mercy. It does not mean that he is forgetful. So if it's out with the old and in with the new, and Paul says, put the earthly self to death, put on a new spiritual self, well, then I guess I need to buckle down and go to about five or six more Bible studies. I need to read my Bible through in a year. I need to tithe 20%. I need to pray before every meal. No, no. This, see, this is why I say understanding our sin and our mess and figuring out what God wants, how we should act is a very big subject. It is hard to understand. I want to show you something that Paul wrote that might help us understand this. Paul described himself as the biggest sinner right? He did. So how did Paul understand it? When Paul was in Rome, uh, he was in prison, and Nero was the emperor. Paul had helped plant the church in Philippi. Here is what he wrote to the Philippian church, okay? This is how he starts. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership with the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul has not seen these people in 10 years. Okay? And he writes to tell them that he's thinking about them. And he says, you know, God started something in you all those 10 years ago, and he is going to complete it. Paul says his prayer for the church at Philippi is that God would complete the work he began in them. Okay? How long is that going to take? <laughs> you know, we elevate the disciples today. Many churches refer to them as saints. Tell me something. Where are the disciples holy and perfect, the moment Jesus said, follow me. No. In fact, some of them were pretty wet behind the ears even long after Jesus went back to heaven. Does the old self just vanish when I become a Christian? And then when I sin, I, I beat myself up because I still sin? Paul tells the Philippian church, here we are now, 10 years removed, and I am still praying for your growth. Christianity is about growth. And that takes time. The end game for us is not perfection. It's maturity. You can cram for a test. You can't cram for maturity. You can't force it. It doesn't happen overnight. Look at all the examples in the way that Jesus taught. A lot of his parables are about agriculture, about baking. You, you plant a seed and then you wait. You make some dough and you wait. Growth takes time. Maturity takes time. Paul says, God is doing something good in you. And it's going to take time. If the goal is new, then we need to get out of this whole start and stop mentality. We're not, we're not making any progress. Following Jesus is not about, well, be good and stay out of trouble. When did Jesus ever teach that? Do you remember any verse where Jesus says, be good and stay out of trouble? He says in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
he it is that bears much fruit. Another example of agriculture, right? Jesus tells us to bear fruit. Well, how long does that take? In Jesus's neck of the woods, he lived near date palm trees and nuts and grapes. Grape vines grow from seeds, maybe takes two to seven years to produce fruit. Your date palm tree can take about four years to produce fruit. Peanuts, a lot faster, four to five months. The point is still the same. Jesus compares you to a plant and it grows and matures and then one day it bears fruit. And Paul says, I pray that God is going to complete what he began in you. Is that what you pray for? We should be working towards maturity. We should be working towards being a fruit bearer. What has God begun in you? What does he want for your life? Just to continually forgive you every single time you mess up? You try hard, you fail, he forgives you, I'll try harder tomorrow. No. Paul says he's working to complete you. What does that goal look like? Well, look what Paul writes next in Philippians, in the next verse, in verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Is that what you are praying for? When I look at this passage, <laughs> do you know what it makes me think? It makes me think that my prayers are pretty shallow. All of my prayers are about insecurity and fear because all, all of my prayers are about me. Can I get to work on time? Does my boss like me? Does he notice me? Is he going to give me a raise? I want to pass this test. I want to pass this class. I want to graduate. I want to avoid that enemy. I really need to pay this bill. I really need to make more money. I would love it if this boy or this girl would like me. I'm sick. Please heal me. What do all these prayers have in common? They're all about me. Making my life better. Is that what it means to be a mature Christian? Just for fun, I went to a secular health website. I read an article by a secular psychologist. I was looking for the definition of what a mature person looks like. This is what one person wrote. Top four definitions of a mature person. You ready? Number one, they take responsibility for their actions. They admit their errors without trying to cover them up. Number two, they put into practice what they learn. We covered that last week, right? Jesus says wise people listen and follow his teaching like the wise man who builds his house on a rock. Okay. Number three, they know their limits and they correctly calculate the risks that are associated with their actions. And here's the best one. Here's what we're talking about today. You ready? Number four, they take into account their influence over others and they don't try to take advantage of their positions of power. They don't cheat. Additionally, mature people know how to listen. They aren't self-centered. They consider other people. They are conscious that they can learn from others and they realize that they are a part of a broader world. In other words, mature people are not self-centered and they think about others. Here's what I think. I think we pray little prayers and then little things happen. Paul's prayer is an insight into what God's will is for you. Paul says, I pray for your love. I pray that your love grows. Have you ever prayed for your love? That your love would grow more and more. Not your pocketbook, 
not your power, not your influence, your love. I said, Lord, give me more love for my wife. Give me more love for my children. Give me more love for my parents. Give me more love for my neighbor. Give me more love for my enemy. That your love would grow deeper. More and more. Love for who? Who is Paul talking about? It's not love for God. It's others. He's not praying that you would have love for the Bible or its rules or that you would keep them all. He's praying for your maturity, your discernment, not to be better at obedience, to get better at love. See, ah, I think we got it wrong. We think God wants us to get better at behavior. But what would be the marker of an obedient and mature Christian? Following him, bearing fruit, maturing, so that one day I look like Christ. But when you look at Christ, what do you see? Do you think of Christ as being someone who obeyed all the rules? Or as someone who loved all the people? Paul's prayer for us is help me to see what you see. Help me to do the things that you teach. How does God see other people? How would he respond to the hurts that are in this world right now? How would God respond to the conflicts that are in this world right now? That's how I should respond. That would be the mark of maturity. If you began to see the world the way God does, and you respond with his love and his grace, that's Christian maturity. Is it gonna happen overnight? No. Growth takes time. Look, if our faith was only about Bible study and trying not to sin, Jesus would never have come. Because the current religion was doing that already. The Pharisees didn't touch sick people, kept women out of worship, tithed on everything, even down to their spice rack. The current religion was all inward. It was about me. I'm trying to act good so I can get to heaven. That was the Old Testament. Jesus came and he, he raised the bar. Last week, we mentioned the Sermon on the Mount. Typically, when you start a long speech, you're, you're supposed to tell everybody where you're going with this, right? You tell them what the topic is about at the very beginning. So right away, at the very beginning, in verse 25, you're only 25 verses in, Jesus tells them what this talk is about. He says in Matthew 5, 23, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Why am I coming with a gift for the altar? My sin, my need for forgiveness. I sinned and now I'm worried about my status as a follower, so I have brought my sacrifice to the temple and I am standing in line. I'm waiting for the priest to hear my confession, to receive my offering, and I'm trying to repair my relationship with God. And then, Jesus comes along and he raises the bar and he says, when you're standing there in the line and you're holding your goat and you remember, I have sinned against another person. Put the goat down and let the guy in front of you go next because your first order of business, he says that, right? Jesus says, first be reconciled to your brother. These are the words of your Messiah. I did not make this up. Jesus says, first, take care of the love and the relationships that you have with others. How does a secular psychiatrist define maturity? 
They take into account the influence over others. They aren't self-centered. They consider other people and they realize they are part of a broader world. Listen, if all you're doing is sin, wash, repeat, you're stuck. You're stuck. God is trying to grow you, to complete a good work in you, not to be a better rule keeper, to be a better lover. Yes, of course, Christianity is about loving God and obeying him. But it's equally about loving others. What is our greatest commandment? Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When he says the second is like it, he means it's equal. It's equally as important. Love your neighbor. That is the path towards maturity. Loving others is what it means to follow. The greatest commandment of Jesus is to put on the new self. So let's add something, okay? Let's add something to our prayers. Super easy homework. Hard subject to wrestle with, but super easy homework. Last week we said, or a couple weeks ago we said, you know, rather than quickly condemn another person or blame another person or poke shame at another person, just remind ourselves, I can recognize a mess when I see one because I am one. This week, I just want you to add one sentence to all your prayers. Add one sentence to all your prayers. Heavenly Father, may my love abound more and more. That's it. May my love abound more and more. And then you will begin to see those names and faces, those people groups, where God is spurring you to love them more. You know, I thank God every time I remember you. When you walk through those doors and I see how you serve, I always thank God for you. You bring this church joy and I appreciate all the ways in which you partner with this community. And I can assure you, I don't know much, but I know this, God is working in your life. And he won't give up. In fact, what he started, he's going to finish. I promise you. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so grateful for the example of your son. And while we may never be perfect, we can learn to love as he loved. May we see the world with his eyes. May we see other people the way he did. Use us. May we be your hands and feet in the mission field that is our neighborhood, our community, our state, our country. Heavenly Father, may our love abound more and more. More love for our children. May our love abound more for our parents. May our love abound more for our neighbors. Teach me to love my spouse more, my grandchildren more. Teach me to love my coworkers and the people that are in my community more. May I learn to love my enemies more. Heavenly Father, may my love abound more and more. May I learn to love like you. May I learn to see the world with that same grace and compassion that you see the world. You saw the mess and that brought you near, but you didn't condemn, you didn't judge, you brought healing and you brought grace. And that is still the work of your church. May your church 
be a place of healing and a place of forgiveness. And may your children grow in love more and more. Amen. Thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, I just want to remind you again that we're here. We are here uh, in the sanctuary every Sunday. We have two services, one at 930. It's a traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing your favorite hymns. We're going to sing out of the hymnal, do responsive reading, say the Lord's Prayer, have communion. It's going to be all the things that you remember from church when you were a child. And we also have a contemporary service at 11. So at 11 o'clock, we have a worship team, we have a worship band. You can come casual, come as you feel led. We're gonna have an uplifting time. We're gonna read the scriptures. And it's also the same hour that we have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. We wanna be the church where you live so that you can be the church where you live. I love you guys. See you Sunday.